The Dark Knight Returns, although this is not the comic book or the animated movie The Dark Knight Returns. This is the movie The Batman, starring Batman, not to be confused with Tim Burton's Batman. Listen, I'm reviewing The Batman. Let's do it. This video is brought to you by Athletic Greens. Go to athleticgreens.com slash Dan to get a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. And be sure to stay tuned after the review for more info. Athletic Greens, the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Hello, everybody. I'm Dan Merle here with my non-spoiler review. Don't worry, no spoilers in this one. I'll have a spoiler review out later for the hotly anticipated The Batman, the first solo Batman movie we've gotten, really, since 2012's The Dark Knight Rises. I saw it tonight at the TCL Theater in Hollywood. That's where I am right now. I'm in Los Angeles. It's actually right behind me back there. Uh, and uh, it was a very electric atmosphere, a lot of fan anticipation for this movie, of course, the TCL, one of the best places to see a movie, uh, certainly in Los Angeles, maybe in the country. So I was very excited. I was able to get tickets for tonight. This is from director Matt Reeves. And one of the things that I like about this movie is that with pretty much every other feature iteration of Batman, it felt like this is Tim Burton's Gotham or this is Zack Snyder's Gotham or Christopher Nolan's Gotham or definitely Joel Schumacher's Gotham. What I love about Matt Reeves is he doesn't put a distinctive stamp on this movie necessarily. This version of Gotham City just feels like Gotham. If I was going to say that it's close to the style of anything that we've seen before as far as Batman goes, it would probably be most analogous to the Batman Arkham games, where Gotham is obviously a huge, sprawling metropolis, but at the same time, it feels real. It feels lived in. The other thing I liked about how they approached this film is this is the first Batman film with this iteration of the character and yet this isn't a Batman origin story and that starts with Gotham City. This is not the Gotham that we're seeing on its worst day. This is a Gotham City that we're seeing on a Thursday. This is also a city that has known the Batman for two years already and there is a fantastic opening sequence where we see the kind of fear that Batman has already instilled in the criminals in Gotham. And let's get right to Batman, as played by Robert Pattinson. It was a casting that was met with a lot of skepticism. Robert Pattinson, again, here doesn't feel like he's playing Robert Pattinson's Batman. He just feels like he's playing Batman. He doesn't get the leg up that a lot of other Batman actors have had, where you have to get through the origin and you get all of his character motivation. He's able to convey that from the very first minute of the film and this is the most Batman that I promise you you have probably ever seen in any movie animated or live action. It really underscores more than any other film that Bruce Wayne is just the person that Batman is when he's not busy. Bruce is in a few scenes. They're kind of fleeting scenes. This is about the detective. And even when he's not in costume, there are times when Robert Pattinson is playing Batman, walking the streets of Gotham, trying to track down who's behind all of these criminal activities. Pattinson doesn't betray a lot of emotion many times when he's playing Batman, but you can always see his mind at work. And we get the most actual detecting in this movie that we've ever seen. This is not a Batman who sits behind the monitors in the Batcave and looks at slides of criminals and tries to figure out what's going on or hacks into networks. This is a Batman who is in the streets of Gotham every single night, in the shadows, underneath the subways, on rooftops. He's undercover. Now, that's not to say that this Batman is devoid of action, and I also loved how this movie approached that aspect because while Batman certainly does relish the idea of being in the shadows or the thought for criminals that he's in every shadow, he also does not shy away from taking on a room full of goons who may not know what he's coming. And the action style of this Batman, I would say, is more akin to a Terminator. Sure, he may have the element of surprise at the beginning, but he is also relentless, and he will go after his target straight on, no matter how much damage he takes, because that's what it takes to get the mission done. On the Bruce Wayne side from Pattinson, we get a very deep well of pain and hurt and damage, because let's Let's be honest, Bruce Wayne is a deeply damaged person. He's had childhood trauma that he has chosen to deal with in a very specific way. And the glimpses that we get of Bruce Wayne is someone who does hide from society, who does shy away from the spotlight because he doesn't want the world to see the damaged person that he is. This is his disguise, and it's something, again, another reason why I think that Batman is on screen so much. The Bruce Wayne, really, that the world knew died the night that Bruce Wayne's parents died. 
died. And this rebirth is the Batman. And I like that this is actually called the Batman because this is the most about the Batman that we've seen on screen. Of course, there are also familiar elements that we see, one of them being Commissioner Gordon, who's played by Jeffrey Wright. But similar to Robert Pattinson, I think he's not saddled with the same scenes that we've seen over and over again of Commissioner Gordon meeting Batman for the first time in an uneasy alliance. They are very close allies from the beginning of this film throughout. Again, the closest that we've seen them together, basically working a case together. Gordon is very much Batman's advocate. You can tell that there is a friendship there. There's also a real funny scene that the two actors share together. There is some levity in this movie and I haven't gotten into too many other people's thoughts because I try not to look into that before I do my own review but something I sort of have gathered from some folks is that they think it's too dark or too dreary. I mean First of all, it's a Batman movie. Secondly, yes, this is a very dark tale, but at the same time, I think to walk away from the entire film with this feeling of dreariness or hopelessness would be to miss a large part of what the movie is about. Now, stylistically, it is incredibly dark. I, t I said that Matt Reeves doesn't put his own distinctive directorial stamp on the movie, but you do evoke things like David Fincher films, and I've seen comparisons to Zodiac. I would throw seven in there as well. I saw some influences from classic horror directors like John Carpenter. I got some Escape from New York vibes uh, in a few parts of this movie. This isn't a pastiche of styles necessarily, but much like the design of Gotham itself, this is a combination of techniques of filming of different styles of cinematography to tell a unique version of this story. Overall, I think this movie did a really smart thing, and I heard a piece of writing advice. I wish I could credit who it was. It's been many, many years since I heard it, but it was advice for writing uh, the pilot episode of a TV show, and uh, the person said, uh, write the first episode, what you think is the absolutely necessary information, and then take that episode, put it in a drawer, and then write episode two. And that's your pilot episode for your TV series. And that's very much what this movie feels like. It feels like that there was already a movie that came out which told all of the Batman origin stories and established all of the character relationships, etc. And then that movie was put in a drawer and this movie was made. And you know what? I don't miss the other movie that we didn't get to see because we carry so much Batman stuff over just through osmosis, cultural osmosis. We don't need to see those things. And this just proves once in a, and, and perhaps for all, I don't think we ever need to see Batman's origin story ever again, ever again. No more popcorn and pearls, no more on-screen death of Thomas and Martha Wayne, no more young Bruce falling into a cave. We don't need that anymore because it's almost modern mythology at this point. Everybody knows that story, and this movie stands completely on its own two legs without having to go into all of those details. However, story-wise, this movie is not perfect. I do feel like there's a bit of sprawl here, and it's a close to three-hour long movie with credits, and I think that there's something that could have gone. I think there's probably about a 20 minute chunk of the movie that could have gone from somewhere and I can get into a little more detail in my spoiler review. This movie does zigzag around a lot and I think that there are a couple of little turns that we didn't necessarily need to take in this film that added to the runtime because there was a point where it kind of felt like it crescendoed and then it feels like we're coasting to the end and then we take another turn and it kind of lulls a little bit and then it comes back up to the end and, and crescendos again and, and I feel like it may have been a little bit too much of a good thing. And because of these zigzags, I think that some of the characters get short shrift. I think some of it is a script problem, and I think some of it is the fact that there's just not enough time for those characters, despite the fact that they're great characters in the film. One of those characters is Colin Farrell as the Penguin. If you'd given me five guesses uh, as to who that actor was, if I didn't know it was him, I never would have guessed that he is playing the Penguin. Uh, again, if you played the Arkham games, this is a very similar kind of Penguin to the one that you may have seen. But uh, he really, like I said, doesn't get a whole lot of screen time, but Colin Farrell makes 125% out of every second of screen time that he does have. And I hope that if this universe continues forward and we get more movies in this Bat universe, there are so many of them at this point, that we get to see even more of this Penguin because, uh, you know, if we do something like we've done where we have a villain in a minor role who then takes a lead role perhaps in a second film, I think that we could have a character-defining role uh, with Colin Farrell as Penguin in the same way that we did, dare I invoke the name, uh, but Heath Ledger as Joker. I think that Colin Farrell could put just as unique 
a mark on the character of Penguin with an expanded role as Heath Ledger was able to do as the Joker. Zoe Kravitz brings a vivaciousness and an independence to Selena Kyle, also known as Catwoman. It's the kind of quality that made Michelle Pfeiffer's version so great. It's also the kind of quality that I feel like was ultimately missing from Anne Hathaway's version in The Dark Knight Rises. And again, she she's able to take a familiar character and put her own stamp on it, bring her own style to it. I think the only thing that really falls short is a failure of the movie in that she is given a presence in two or three of the different storylines that are kind of happening across the film. So oftentimes it feels like her character is there solely in service of the story instead of being given the time to expand and really establish who she is as much as a lot of the other characters in the film. But again, there is room for growth. There is room for expansion. They do get the Batman Selena Kyle relationship, probably the best of anything I've seen except for maybe Batman the Animated Series, which did that relationship so well. I think if they're able to develop more of Catwoman Selena Kyle and her relationship with Bruce Wayne, you could have a character-defining turn as far as their interaction and their ongoing relationship. The idea that one of them hedges toward the sides of criminality and the other one hedges toward the side, of course, with Batman of enforcing the law, but both in their own unique ways. We have some real opportunity here for what could become of this relationship. Paul Dano's Riddler is scarily effective. He is somebody who, again, shares the the basics of the character that you know as the Riddler, that very sick sense of humor, the grotesque sort of puns and these riddles uh, that you know, but it's also a, a bit more of a modern take. Uh, he's somebody who uses all of the tools at his disposal, including social media, to make his point, and there is some commentary there about the people who are watching Riddler on social media, the idea of somebody taking a populist message message and spinning it to use it uh, for not such a good reason. There is the inevitable info dump about his character at one point, and I think maybe that's what some of that 20 minutes that I was talking about could have been. I think some of that information is perhaps not necessary to the effectiveness of his character, and I'll get into more details about that later on when I do my spoiler review, but I think that's where you could have actually cut out some details, but for the parts that he's given, he is very effective, especially for somebody who has very limited contact as far as one-on-one -on -one interaction. I think it's smart to put the Riddler at this stage in Batman's career because he's in year two of being a crime fighter. He's certainly not perfect yet, and this is a villain who is really able to test Bruce Wayne slash Batman's capabilities and intelligence as a crime fighter, and even tricks him into a few mistakes, which is something that we're really not used to seeing in a whole lot of Batman films. Of all of the major returning characters, I think the one that gets the shortest shrift is Andy Serkis as Alfred. And when I talked about the fact that this movie really stands on its own two legs without the information that we've seen in so many other movies. I think that the character that's most reliant on knowing what you already know about the Batman mythology is the character of Alfred because there's so much happening that there just really isn't that much time to go into the Bruce Alfred dynamic. I did like how Robert Pattinson and Andy Serkis approach their roles and there are some really great moments between those two but this really seemed like an idea where there were some very exciting ideas for all of these different characters. Gordon, Riddler, Penguin, Catwoman, obviously Batman, and it felt like, oh, well, we don't really have something that great for Alfred in this movie, so again, hopefully, maybe they can come up with something later, but, but Alfred is a support character. I am a huge Batman fan, and I don't make any secret of that, but I also don't have a hard and fast definition about what Batman can or should be. That's one of the reasons I put something like Batman Ninja in my top 10 favorite Batman movies of all time, because I like being surprised with different ways that the character is taken, and while this hits a lot of the familiar Batman beats. I also don't think that this is like any other version of Batman that you've seen in live action. This is very much more of an animated film or video game aesthetic to Batman, much more of an established Batman. Uh, a movie that doesn't really revolve around set pieces, that doesn't really revolve around big crime heist scenes. It's very much more about the unraveling of the Gotham underworld, about Batman digging deep into the rot of Gotham. And every time he thinks he's hit the bottom, he just unearths another crypt that's even darker and dirtier and more rotten than the one 
before it. Is it the best Batman movie that I've ever seen? Uh, I, I don't think so, but I would say it is definitely one of the better or best Batman movies that I've seen. I came out of it very happy. I came out of it looking forward to where they may go in the future. And really, it's, I, I don't know what more you could ask for. If you're demanding perfection, if you're demanding the Dark Knight from every single Batman movie, well, then you're going to be disappointed a lot of the time because you don't get that. But what we have here is a really solid story that I do think could have had some things excised. You have some great performances all around. I would say there's not a bad performance in this movie. As a matter of fact, I'd say just about everyone in this movie is great. And you have some really intriguing ideas about where to go from here. The Batman franchise is one that is very well trodden. We've seen so many different versions, so many different directors and actors with their different takes. But I think that it is actually in good hands. I hope that we see uh, the main uh, principal players come back for another one of these because we could be talking about potentially another series of great Batman films. And if we can get two or three or four more movies with some great Batman stories, I mean, great Batman stories have been told for since the 1940s and there's no shortage of them and I think that we have a great storyteller here with Matt Reeves uh, at command of this franchise I think we have some great actors in the lead roles and I think that we have the potential for some great Batman movies ahead including this one which I found very, very enjoyable. So those are my thoughts on The Batman. Are you excited for the film? Did you catch the special fan IMAX previews tonight? That's where I was. Let me know down in the comments below. Stay tuned later this week here on the channel because I will also be doing a spoiler review for this film. And before I go, I'd also like to thank the sponsor for this video, which is Athletic Greens. A lot of movie watching like I've been doing with all these Batman movies lately means a lot of inactivity. That also means that I have to be even more careful about what what I'm eating and drinking and doing every day and something that's really helped me with that is Athletic Greens. It's called Nutritional Insurance for a reason. Athletic Greens makes sure that you don't have to take all of these different supplements scattered around. It's really expensive. It's hard to keep track of. With Athletic Greens, you get great things like vitamins, probiotics, so many things that your body needs and craves all in one convenient scoop. You can put it in a cup of water daily. You can put it in a smoothie. You can take it pretty much however you want because the other thing is that it actually tastes good, which is something Something that I enjoy for a supplement, something that I'm going to look forward to drinking every morning. Athletic Greens was designed and made by people who wanted to make it quick and easy for you to get the stuff that your body needs in a way that ensures that it's going to be absorbed and in a way that is quick and easy. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com dan. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash D-A-N to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Thank you so much to Athletic Greens for sponsoring this video and thank you for watching. I'll see you back here this week for my spoiler video. Until then, take care. Bye.